Hey guys, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge, and I'm really excited that you have decided to take time out of your busy schedules to come and hang out today. We're really grateful for you tuning in. And if you have been listening to the podcast for a while, we really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Hopefully you have subscribed so that you never miss an episode. But if not, or if you are new to the show, get yourself over to iTunes, Stitcher, AnimalTrainingAcademy.com or whatever it is you're listening to this podcast on and hit the subscribe button to make sure you don't miss a single episode. We are bringing you today's episode on behalf of the Animal Training Academy or ATA membership. If you like the conversations in these podcasts, then I want to invite you to continue them with like-minded people within the ATA membership area, which you can find out more about over on the ATA website. Within the membership, you can get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalogue of previous web classes, plus a huge library of videos and projects to problem solve different training situations and we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private facebook group forums area and whatsapp chat groups it's like a netflix social media platform for animal behavior nerds but we will get started on today's episode where we will be talking to one ken ramirez Ken is the Executive Vice President and Chief Training Officer of Karen Pryor Clicker Training, where he oversees the vision, development and implementation of training education programs for the organisation, including Clicker Expo, Karen Pryor Academy and The Ranch. This allows Ken to help bring positive reinforcement training to all corners of the animal training world. Previously, Ken served as the Executive Vice President of Animal Care and Animal Training at Chicago's Shed Aquarium, where he developed and supervised animal care and animal health programs, staff training and development, as well as public presentation programs for a collection of more than 32,000 animals. Ken worked at Shed Aquarium for over 25 years. He's written for numerous scientific publications and authored countless popular articles. He authored the book Animal Training, Successful Animal Management Through Positive Reinforcement, published in 1999, and Better Together, The Collected Wisdom of Modern Dog Trainers, published in 2017. Ken taught a graduate course on animal training at Western Illinois University for 20 years and currently offers several online courses through the Karen Pryor Academy. In 2017, Ken moved to Washington State where he created a series of immersive hands-on training courses at the ranch, the Karen Pryor National Training Center. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome one Ken Ramirez to the Animal Training Academy podcast show today. Ken's patiently waiting by. Ken, good morning. How are you? Hi, how are you, Ryan? Thanks for inviting me. It's been an absolute pleasure. People that listen to the show have been requesting this episode for a long time, so I'm very excited to be here. And am I correct that it's morning where you are? It is. Um, well, it's uh, almost. It's almost noon. So yeah, it's it's still the last part of the morning. It's uh, it's uh, just a little before lunchtime. Sometimes I don't know whether to say good morning, good afternoon, <laughs> or good evening. Uh, but good morning to you. Let's dive straight in to the first question today, Kim. Could you please take everyone listening back to your early days young ken ramirez where did <laughs> young where did young ken ramirez start out and when did you first learn about positive reinforcement animal training um, well it's uh, my my start was not necessarily in a positive reinforcement world I, I grew up on a cattle ranch in southern new mexico and so i grew up around uh, uh, herding dogs and re- grew up around horses and was around animals my entire life life. Uh, Not really very aware of training, although my grandfather and uncle who ran the ranch certainly were training their horses and training their dogs. They weren't necessarily positive reinforcement trainers. Uh, They just did what they had been shown how to do as uh, as they grew up in that particular uh, uh, venue. Uh, Then when I was in high school, uh, I had an opportunity to volunteer at a guide dog organization, and I began to learn a little little bit about uh, guide dog training. And I spent my entire last three years of high school first volunteering at the guide dog uh, school and then eventually actually being paid as a youth handler, helping to train dogs for um, 
for people that were for young people. I wasn't actually a trainer. I was a handler, but I would be handling the dogs as the professional trainer standing next to me would say, hold the leash this way or say this or pet the dog now or do whatever. Um, at that particular time, that was my first real exposure to training. And although they certainly used positive reinforcement in very in a lot of different aspects of the tasks that we were training the dogs to do, but they also used a uh, corrections and aversive tools as well. So my first exposure to training was not exclusively positive reinforcement, but really exposure to uh, all of the different tools that are used in, in traditional training. And uh, But it was that experience at working with guide dogs that really expanded my mind and made me think about the fact that that might be a fascinating career. And I think it was the first opportunity that I had to see intelligent disobedience at work where dogs were trained to follow um, cues and follow uh, instructions from the handler reliably 100% of the time, except under these specific conditions. And when the dog was faced with uh, a condition that might um, that might put the handler at risk, the dog was supposed to disobey and not do what he was asked to do. And I remember being just blown away by the fact that a dog could recognize uh, what to do in those conditions. In other words, told, this is what you do. 95% of the time, you do exactly what you're told. But under these 5% of the conditions, you disobey and you don't do what you're told to do. And that's what they referred to as intelligent disobedience. And I think it was that experience that sort of prompted my interest in concept training. Uh, it's something that I've been very fascinated with throughout my entire career. And it was that experience that said, I want to do that when I grow up. I want to go to college and figure out how I can be a dog trainer. Because at the time, I thought, what what cooler job could there possibly be than playing with dogs all day long, but doing it for a noble purpose? And so, as a very young and uh, 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 motivated young uh, young man, I really sort of geared myself toward learning about training. But then college has a way of taking on a life of its own. And I went in lots of different directions, studied a lot of different uh, things. And uh, toward the end of my college uh, career, and it wasn't when it was quite over, but I, I took a job at a uh, marine life park. And I took a job in the education department of a facility that had dolphin shows and sea lion shows and uh, reptile and bird shows. And I, um, and I took a job helping to teach classes and help narrate some of their animal presentations for the public. And much to my surprise, the training techniques that they were using to train the dolphins and the whales and the sea lions were exactly what I had learned about in, in dog training. I had no idea that that, that, that uh, discipline spread to other animals or that the same techniques would be utilized uh, the same way I had learned with the dog were being used with these other exotic animals. And that ended up leading me to working there. Uh, they offered me a job as an entry-level trainer. And that was when I first got exposed to what I would call almost entirely positive reinforcement training. There was no, when working with animals like dolphins and whales, you, you, you can't put a leash on them. You can't give them an electric shock. You can't really coerce them to, to, to do anything they don't want to do. And I, I, I was exposed to this world of positive reinforcement training. And, and at the time, being naive and new, I assumed, oh, it must be that with exotic animals, you use positive reinforcement. With domestic animals, of course, you have to use both. At least that's what I had perceived because that's what I had been exposed to at that point in my young career. You said about using animal training to work for no noble purposes, and we're going to talk about that today. I'm excited about that. And up, up until that first job, then you got this job and you're seeing positive reinforcement with all of these exotic animals and you're making these, uh, I, these ideas are starting to bubble up in your mind about how it works, where it works, what it works with. What, what is one story from around that time that kind of really sticks out into your mind that, that left a, a lasting lesson that you still use and think about today? Well, I think for me, it had everything to do with the fact that in that early time in my career, I was working at an organization that had a wide 
variety of animals. So I had, uh, I was working with dolphins, I was working with killer whales, I was working with sea lions, but I was also working with birds of prey. I was also working with cockatoos and macaws. I was also working with tigers and lions and panthers, and I was working with primates. And I think the thing that really blew my mind away was, you know, when you first start working with an animal like a dolphin, you are immediately taken by how intelligent they seem to be and how easy they are to train. Um, but it was when I started working with birds and I started working with big cats and I saw that they learned the same way that there, there began to be this little voice inside my head that said, there's a connection here that all animals learn the same way. And this was at a time where when I look back, this was 40 years ago for me. And when I look back at that time in my career, I worked with with tigers and lions in a in free contact. I wasn't working in a protected contact situation like is done in most zoos today. I was in there with the animals and I was surprised. I was taken by the fact that um, I could go in there with these large exotic animals and I didn't have to take a stick or a whip or a or any kind of device to keep the animals in line. And, and it struck me as I compared what I had seen done with those types of large, dangerous animals in a circus setting and seeing what we were doing in our setting. And I thought, why is it so different? And one of my bosses at the time said, well, it's because you're building a relationship with these animals and they trust you. And because they trust you, you don't have to force them to, to do anything. You're not asking them to do anything that they don't want to do. You are simply requesting that they participate. And if they choose to participate, you reinforce them. And if they choose not to participate, they go off and sleep in the corner. And I thought, well, that's amazing to me. And then I began realizing how seldom they ever went and slept in the corner. They wanted to participate. They kept wanting to, to do what we were doing. And I thought, well, this is just amazing. We are, we are using training as a form of communication, as a form of relationship building, as a form of, of really getting to know an animal really well. And, and it's this shared experience. And I think uh, for me, it wasn't like one moment that I just went, oh, wow, I have this aha moment. But it was that exposure over the course of those first two years working with so many different animals. I, I think it was probably the moment that maybe made me really aware of it and be somewhat introspective and thoughtful about it was when... I, when I went into working there, I was always in my head saying, I'm going to work with guide dogs for the blind eventually. I'm going to go back to working with guide dogs. That's why I started on this journey. Um, and I remember thinking to myself, there was this opportunity that I had to consider going to work again for a guide dog organization. And I thought, no, I'm not, not sure I'm ready to go do that right now. I'm learning too much. And I also found myself wondering, is this is that use of punishment and correction that I had to use so frequently for certain aspects of guide dog training, is that really necessary? It would seem to me that if we can get a tiger and a lion um, much more aggressive and assertive animals than most dogs I know um, – to, to work well and, and, and participate cooperatively, it would seem to me that this could be done with dogs as well. But I wasn't in a position, I was still too young of a trainer to come in and change the guide dog world. Uh, and I realized that. And I realized, no, I want to keep doing this exotic animal thing for a little bit longer. And so that really was uh, what kept me on that journey and kept me to this day involved in, in, in exotic animal training. And it's almost... It's almost fascinating to me that uh, I now have done and continue to do consulting with guide dog organizations, but I didn't start doing that till, uh, gosh, it was like 15 years ago. So it's uh, 25 years after my last time working with guide dogs when I thought that was going to be my career. It was not until I was really a professional trainer and been in this career for several decades that I came back to the guide dog world again. And part of my involvement in guide dog training has been trying to bring positive reinforcement training to that community. So with your time building your relationships and you talked about a little voice inside your head <laughs> talking to you and going, hang on, Ken, what's going on here? Uh, 
we, you were in there with large cats and everything. Wow, it's uh, that is. I I, I kind of tell you, I think about Ryan. I think about that today, and I think, well, that is just crazy. I, I in some of my classes, I have video of that time period, and I show it just to to to, to talk about relationship building. But I always say to myself, well, I watch that video of me running around with big tigers, you know, uh, and and rolling on the ground with them, and I think to myself, what was I thinking? I would never do that today, but I I loved it and enjoyed it when I did it back then. So your little voice is inside your head going, this, this is great, learning about relationships. What is, what is the little voice inside Ken's head telling you in 2019? I nearly said 2018. What is the voice inside your head telling you at the moment? What are the, what are the new thoughts that are coming to your mind and going, hang on, Ken? Well, you know, it's interesting because uh, my that little voice inside my head is talking to me all the time. Um, in some ways, I'm surprised that there's there's a lot of things that haven't changed. But at the uh, uh, but on the flip side, there is a lot that has changed. And for me, I'm very appreciative of the fact that I have had the opportunity to work with a wide variety of animals, far greater diversity than I would have ever imagined. Even at the beginning, when I was working with a dozen different species, species. Um, I had no idea where my career would take me. And now I find myself actually helping other people learn about this concept that it's possible to train animals in another way. I, I, I still find that in the professional dog training world, that there is still a lot of use of corrections, a lot of use of aversive tools, uh, because obviously they work. There's no question that uh, a use of punishment is a very powerful tool. There's a reason we used it back then when I was training, and there's a reason why it's still used today. And so often I find myself working with not just guide dog organizations, but law enforcement organizations, military organizations, search and rescue organizations, quite a variety of of trainers who love their dogs, want their dogs to do a, a great job and want their, jo- their, their dogs to do the task at hand and to do it well. Um, and they kind of grew up in an environment like I did where where it's not the positive reinforcement isn't there. There's plenty of positive reinforcement in those communities, but there's also punishment. There's also corrections. And so that little voice inside my head today is saying, how how do I find an effective way to work with those organizations and how can I help them come up with that aha moment themselves? How can I help them? Uh, Because the reality is for me to come in and say, you should change, let me tell you what I did and why you should do the same thing, is not a very effective way to make change. If, if, If you want people to make changes in how they work and how they interact with their animals, in many ways, they have to discover it for themselves. And so, um, how can I set up an environment? How can I set up a learning experience? How can I come into their organization if they invite me there and help them to come to that realization? And so that has been my mission, I guess. I want to say for the last 15, 20 years, it's really been the last couple, couple decades of my career that I've really begun to venture out of the zoological community. I still do a lot of work in the zoo world, but I even find that that the work that I do in the zoo community is the same. I get brought into organizations in Asia, organizations in South America, organizations where they are working with exotic animals and find themselves using some traditional tools. And so I find myself frequently um, spending half my time with organizations that have already embraced positive reinforcement and helping them to use it better. And then the other half of my time is spent trying to help people have those uh, those light bulb moments that I had uh, to help guide them toward the use of positive reinforcement if they're not using it uh, exclusively at this time. It's it's really interesting to learn. I'm thinking maybe we should call this podcast episode a conversation with the little voice inside Ken Ramirez's head. (laughs) 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 With with Ken Ramirez. And we're going to talk about all of this stuff later on in the episode. I'm really excited about uh, that part of this specific episode that we're going to talk about. How, How Ken creates these learning experiences and how he sets 
individuals up in these organisations to come to these realisations themselves. So keep listening because we're going to dive into that stuff a little bit later. Hey, there's, there's a question I ask people, Ken, sometimes. I'm going to rephrase it for you, though. <laughs> and the question normally goes, if you could go back to young Ken, what would you say to him? But let's, let's rephrase this. If a little voice inside Ken's head in 2019 could talk to the little voice inside Ken's head back when he started working for that first aquarium, what, what would he say? What would that little voice say to the earlier little voice? You know, it's a great question because I think uh, uh, I don't I think of myself today as still being you know you, you never realize how old you have become until perhaps you're looking at the young people around you um, but I, I I still picture myself as the as the 19 year old kid that, that 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 got started working with exotic animals and so I I still look at the training world with the world uh, uh, with a wondrous awe about about what I do and and find myself pinching myself all the time that I get to do this and I I I I I've made a career out of being able to work with animals and so um, it's interesting I I would you would hope and I think that I probably have uh, wisdom and knowledge today that I didn't have back then uh, but. But I still, I still look at it with the same kind of wonder and enthusiasm that I did back then. And so there's, there's, I, I, I if I were to ask, if I was to give myself some advice, uh, I think the advice that I would give myself is there's a lot that I discovered and learned and realizations about how to make my training better that. I went around down a lot of dark alleys and made a lot of mistakes and a lot of, uh, of, um, errors along the way. And I I sometimes wonder if I would tell myself, warn myself not to go down those paths and help myself learn how to make those discoveries sooner. But then I realize I don't know that I would be as skilled uh, or as good at what I do if I hadn't gone down those wrong paths. Because oftentimes, um, the making of those mistakes made it far clearer to me uh, why I want to go down the path that I'm going down. And what I mean by that is I don't believe that someone has to be an expert at using punishment to realize the benefits of positive reinforcement. But I definitely think that there was an advantage to me, particularly as I want to go work with these organizations that are using aversive tools, the fact that I was in an environment that used them and understood how to use them, felt that there was a need to use them back then, while it would be great to go back and tell myself, hey, you young Ken, you don't have to do that. Don't do that. But I would not have had the ability to convince my bosses that it wasn't the right way to go. And I either would have then felt the need to quit working there or would have felt unhappy about working there. But instead, I was in I was in ignorant bliss, not knowing that there was a better way, learning how to use those tools. And that has paid me big dividends as a consultant now, because when I watch people who are using aversive tools or using corrections, I can look back and go, absolutely understand why you do that. I understand why you feel that's the best way to go, because I was there myself. And so that experience was so good for me. And so what you're hearing me, Ryan, do right now is think out loud and realize there's a voice inside of me that would say, don't do that. But I realized that if I did, I don't know that I would be able to work with those organizations as skillfully today because... And I'm not saying to anybody listening that if your jo- if your go- goal is to go work with organizations that use punishment and he- and you want to help make those changes that you need to go and start using punishment so you feel what figure out what it's like. I'm not suggesting that at all. I would be the last would be the last thing that I would recommend. However, as I watch young trainers today who perhaps grew up in a positive reinforcement environment and never worked in those other environments, for many of them, they are baffled as to why people think they need to use punishment and are not very understanding of people's use of those tools because they've learned that they didn't have to use it and they just wish that other people didn't use them. And it makes them less effective sometimes at dealing with those people whose opinions they want to change because they don't don't understand why that those tools are used. And so 
It's a long way of saying I'm not sure I would warn myself or give myself any information because I'd be afraid that it would have taken me down a different path. And I'm happy with the path that I took, even the mistakes that I made. There are definitely some mistakes that I made, errors that I made. But so often when I look at the way I teach training, and, I, and, not, and it's not just about the use of positive reinforcement, but it's the use of setting up a training session, the way I build a relationship, the way I use reinforcers, um, a lot of that came from making mistakes and realizing why those pathways weren't the best pathways. And so I guess I might not give myself any tips other than don't give up, keep trying, keep an open mind. I mean, I might give myself some generic things like that, but I would be too afraid of taking myself off the path that led me to where I am today because I'm really pleased with where it's taken me. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And it it, uh, draws parallels with things other guests have said, I think, that have have also been through similar learning histories of themselves. I'm I'm wondering, was was young, (laughs) were you, I'm going to refer to you as young Ken Ramirez, was young Ken Ramirez kind on himself when he made mistakes? No, no, I wasn't. But, you know, I also... um, I grew up in an environment of pretty harsh aversives, you know, uh, from from my mom, who was a pretty strict disciplinarian, to I was in I was in sports as a growing up in school, and my coaches were harsh disciplinarians. My first bosses were harsh disciplinarians. So they were they were all people who, while compassionate individuals. Uh, ruled with an iron fist and yelled, screamed, uh, told you you were an idiot, cussed you out if you did something wrong. And and so um, I grew up in an environment with lots of harshness. And so, um, I mean, I was kind to myself in the sense that I didn't literally kick myself or hurt myself, but I definitely found myself uh, down on myself and frustrated when I would make mistakes and and um, and trying to say how can I make sure I don't make that mistake again. Uh, so no, I was I was not kind to myself uh, because that had not been modeled for me. Kindness wasn't a a tool being used very often by many of my mentors in those early days. And, and so do you think you'd want to to tell the little voice inside Ken's head when he was young um, about being kinder to yourself? Or do you also feel that that frustration that you felt and you know that was important for you as well? No, no. You know, I don't know. That's a really good question because certainly when I am, uh, when I raised my daughter, when I supervise staff uh, that, uh, that work for me, um, I take a very kind, gentle approach. I'm a big believer in using positive reinforcement with people. Uh, so I don't use those tools today. Um, but yet, those experiences were very beneficial to me. Now, it's a very interesting question. I've had this discussion with other trainers before where we talk about our experiences growing up. And uh, I, I know I, I know one trainer, uh, a very well-known trainer said to me once when I was telling my stories about my harsh upbringing, they said, gosh, can't imagine how much better you'd even be today if you'd been raised using positive reinforcement. You might have been able to go even farther. Maybe. I mean, that's possible. Um, I don't know. Um, But um, I I might have said to myself, don't be so hard on yourself. Um, Definitely. Um, But um, I certainly learned a lot from those experiences, uh, but I wouldn't want to relive them again. I was a witness to people around me who did not succeed. And maybe the only thing I will say that was beneficial about my mom being such a strict disciplinarian was that it taught me resilience. It taught me uh, not to give up just because my coach or my boss is harsh. Since my mom was that way too, I kind of think I just learned that that's just part of how you grow up. Um, But I, in both my sports career and in my uh, working life early on, I saw many of my colleagues and many of my friends who failed, who dropped out, who quit, who gave up because they couldn't take the harsh treatment of the boss or the coach. And 
I am someone who doesn't like that treatment at all either, that somehow or other, it didn't derail me. It didn't cause me to quit. And uh, uh, so maybe because I was exposed to that in my upbringing, uh, it, it, it made me a little bit more uh, accepting of it. And, 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 it, and it raises an interesting question about, you know, is that an important aspect in teaching an animal to accept that kind of treatment? Uh, uh, but of course, my goal is to say, well, why should we ever put an animal in a situation where they need to accept that kind of treatment? So, no, let's not go that route. I don't. I raised my daughter. I I taught classes, and I've been a boss or a supervisor in a variety of work organizations where I've stayed clear of 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 any kind of use of aversive other than in the most severe situation. And what I mean by that is sometimes you run into a situation like if you're working in a bank and you decide to reach into the till and put a $5 bill in your pocket, the policy of that organization might simply be you were fired. And while I would have loved a different approach to dealing with that kind of situation, the policy of that organization was no. That's an unacceptable, uh, an unacceptable behavior, and we cannot tolerate it. Um, but even then, in my own organization, if I could get away with uh, finding an alternative behavior or a different way of dealing with it, I would certainly try it. But there are there are situations in the working world where. Sometimes you have to finally say to a staff member, this isn't working out. And we do the same thing in the dog world. You know, sometimes I've worked with a lot of dogs in, in the guide dog world, for example, that, that don't make it. But instead of forcing them down the path of learning to be a better guide dog, uh, we call them career change dogs. And they end up do, going in a different direction. And what I think we've learned is, well, that wasn't the job for that dog. So let's find a different job that this dog can do well. Um, and I think that's what we have to do with people as well sometimes and say, maybe this isn't the right job for you. Let's find a job that you're better suited for. But we're going off on a tangent now, and I don't even remember what your question was. I apologize. <laughs> I said to you before we recorded, Ken, that, that I want to get your passion talking, and thanks, uh, Theresa McEwen, for that, that phrase. And I'll know that I've been successful if you say I can't even remember what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> So, so just thinking about this bank metaphor, and we're going to move on because we've got other stuff we want to talk about, but you say that that person might put a $5 note in their pocket and they might get fired because that is the policy of that specific bank, uh, but you might do things differently. I'm, I'm just thinking as you're talking about that, maybe that's a way to view clients that we work with that they have a policy in their house that this is what happens in this situation and the verse of is dealt. So our job is to go into a bank or the client's house and, and review their policies. <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, I think oftentimes one of the things, I do a lot of courses on positive reinforcement with people. And one of the things that I look at when I look at people is when it is rare that I think that an employee or a, a an athlete or a student messes up on purpose. I mean, occasionally, yes, there are the those bad elements, that person who, no, they went into that bank with the intention of stealing and they knew it was wrong, but that's what they wanted to do because they are poor, they're broke, they need the money, whatever the reasoning is. And and, and that's a very different situation. Um, and, and I think that... Uh, uh, those are those rare bad elements that we all have in our in, in our world. And you know, if uh, you come across a dog who has had a bad history and he's uh, aggressively attacking something, you have no choice. And this is not a dog that you've trained. You might have no choice but to go in and use some kind of aversive control just to get the dog safely away from the person it's attacking. And 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 then you have to sit back and rethink how to address the situation. When I'm dealing with people, the way I ask the question is, did I not make the rules of this employment clear? Is it possible that I failed to mention this set of rules and perhaps failed to explain why these rules are important? Because oftentimes what I find is when employees don't do a job well, it is often because they didn't understand what the job was or they weren't given the tools to do the job well or to understand why the job needed to be done in a specific way. And so I always come 
come back to trying to reframe the instructions and reframe how I went about teaching them. And I assume the responsibility for that because as the teacher, as the boss, as the supervisor, it's my responsibility to make sure it's learned well. And so I think that that is our job is to go in and say, okay, let's let's figure out why the rules aren't being followed. What have we not done? Have we not set the environment up to make it easy uh, to follow the rules? And I think that's a good place to move on to the the next thing we're going to talk about because I'm really excited about it and I know that you're passionate about it. But let's leave on that note. Did I not make the rules of this employment fair? <laughs> think about that for the animals in your care potentially. Let's uh, let that one marinate in our minds. Uh, Ken, before we do talk about conservation, do you want to just give everyone a quick overview of where they can go to find out more about you and get in touch and... Uh, well, certainly. Uh, there's a couple places. I would certainly say I would suggest that if people want to find out more about some of the courses I teach or some of the things that I'm doing, you can always go to the Karen Pryor Clicker Training website, which is www.clickertraining.com. And if you go there, uh, there are a variety of tabs across the top of that website. You can click on a tab that says the ranch, and that talks about all the courses that I teach here at the ranch. And there's a Clicker Expo tab, which talks about a lot of the things that I do at Clicker Expo. Um, and that's probably the best place to really find out what's going on and what I'm up to. Um, and then I also write a regular uh, uh, column uh, every month. I have a letter from Ken, which is usually my musings on some training topic. Sometimes it's full of meaty training content, and sometimes it's opinions about variety of training ideas. And uh uh, I've been doing that. I followed Karen's lead on that one. Uh, when Karen was uh, leading the company, she would wrote, write a, a monthly letter. And so I do the same thing. Perfect. And we will link to all of the stuff in the show notes if you wanted to uh, end up there via that route. But thanks so much for everything and sharing everything uh, so far, the, so far, Ken. I loved hearing about that and what we call people's behavioral odysseys. So enjoyed <laughs> hearing your behavioural odyssey there. Moving forward, though, as mentioned, I'd like to talk about some exciting projects, something something that you're very passionate about, uh, and that is your involvement with behaviour and conservation. Can you talk to the podcast audience a little bit about this? Uh, yeah, it's an interesting area. It's not an area where there's a lot of information out there. If uh, I, I frequently get people who ask me, hey, how can I get involved in conservation training? Where can I learn more about conservation training? And the reality is there isn't a lot of places to find out about it because it's sort of a, a new frontier. But when I say it's a new frontier, it's not that it hasn't been going on for 20 years or more. It's just... Um, it's not the first thing we think about when we think about saving wildlife, whether it's uh, saving the, the California condor from extinction or the Mexican gray wolf or polar bears along the Arctic Circle or elephants in Africa, uh, bilbies in Australia. Um, these are all uh, various projects that I've been involved with, and they involve behavior management. They, be, they involve uh, using our training skills to adjust and change the behavior of animals in the wild in a way that will help protect them uh, uh, from extinction. Um, and many times, some of those uh, interventions are because of human interaction. Uh, the the Bilby project that I was involved with in Australia had to do with uh, a highway being built in Australia that ended up forcing Bilbies to uh, relocate closer to urban areas where... Uh, um, feral cats would then attack and eat them and cause their population to decline. Or in Alaska or in some Scandinavian countries where polar bears were making their way into villages and attacking dogs and hurting people, and there was a need to figure out how to retrain the polar bears to move and look for food elsewhere. Um, an elephant conservation project in which poachers are killing elephants uh, and we needed to find a safer route for the elephants to go and we worked uh, on training the elephants to to change their migration route so that they would avoid the areas where it was easy for poachers to get at them. Um, those are examples of projects that I've been involved with in which we, we look at the environment that these animals live in and say, okay, how can I 
Or how can my team come into this environment and do something to help change their behavior that will help keep them out of danger, that will help protect them, that will help uh, help them live in more harmony with the humans that live in those particular areas. And so that's what conservation training is. Conservation training is, is utilizing our knowledge of animal behavior and finding ways to apply that, not just to animals in a zoological setting. Certainly, that's where some of these skills were first learned for me. But it was realizing that animals learn 24 hours a day. All animals learn all the time. Whether there's a trainer there helping to control what they learn, animals learn every time something occurs in their environment. They learn to avoid danger. They learn to find food. They learn to find shelter. And if we are able to come into that environment and set the environment up properly, we can teach them skills and we can teach them how to avoid danger. We can do things that help them. And I think for most people, um, it seems like a uh, an oxymoron or it seems like a, a counterintuitive to do this because so much of what we talk about as trainers is about relationship building. I talked about it earlier in the podcast about how important relationship building is to training. But when it comes to conservation training, often we're using what is referred to as remote training, where we are we may be pulling the strings and providing the reinforcement, but we are not allowing the animals to perceive that that reinforcement is coming from people so that these animals in the wild are not becoming dependent on people. They're not becoming habituated to people, but yet they are still learning um, the things that we want them to learn. Uh, Like with the elephant uh, migration project that I was just talking about, that's a project that we're still very actively involved in right now. And a big part of that was putting up some barriers to make their original route harder to go down, but more importantly, providing uh, man-made watering holes along a new route to reinforce them for going in a different direction. But for us not to be a part of that picture and to be out of the scene so that the elephants were just sort of making their own decisions, but we helped them make those decisions by making reinforcers available, and they didn't see us delivering those reinforcers. They appeared to be reinforcers just naturally delivered by the environment. And it's a way of shaping behavior without the animals even aware that people are involved in that situation at all. And in many cases, that's necessary because in so much of the world, we as a human race have taken over the world. We control uh, the world in ways that whether it's right or wrong, we do. And it causes a lot of the real risks that animals face in the world today are because of human development, because of human encroachment, because of uh, habitat destruction, because of construction of, of, of human things. And so often it's up to us to go in and see how can we correct that. And it's a, it's a difficult balance. And it's one that's a hard one. It uh, It's probably some of the most difficult work that I do today is working in conservation um, because you're, we're we're talking about trying to control behavior of animals that have the whole world around them. There's no barriers. There's no, uh, you know, it's not easy to control that environment. And they have so many reinforcers available to them that we that it requires a lot of very careful planning. Uh, so it's a it is a. a um, a subject that's important to me um, and one that each time I get involved in a new project, I usually have to convince government agencies, wildlife biologists to go in that route because it's not usually the first thing that people think of when it comes to conservation management. Oh, let's go find a trainer and let's retrain the animals in the wild. That's just not the first thought in people's minds. And it's not an easy thing to do in a way that is safe and that is respectful of the environment and that is helpful to those animals in the wild. And so it requires a very thoughtful process. And many of these projects require five or six years of planning before you actually ever implement them. And then the implementation can take another 10 to 12 years to accomplish. So you're, th- you're talking about a project that's, that, that requires 15 or 20 years commitment to really see results. 
Well, earlier in the podcast, you talked about wanting to work for a noble purpose with the guide dogs. Uh, so this obviously is a very noble purpose to be dedicating your time to and, and over those long periods that you just mentioned. And with, with the elephants, a lot, I'd like to talk a little bit, if it's okay with you, about some of the specific projects uh, you've been involved in. So you mentioned the elephants there, the bilbies. Uh, there's probably a significant chunk of podcast listeners who are thinking, what the heck is a bilby <laughs> if you're not from Australia? Um, you said you, you mentioned to me earlier a chimp project in Sierra Leone? Yes, that was one of my very first big uh, conservation projects was a uh, chimp project in Sierra Leone. Um, Poaching in uh, Sierra Leone with chimpanzees was really a big, big factor and a real problem. And uh, uh, it's kind of interesting how that particular project came to be because I was meeting with some park rangers from Sierra Leone. They were visiting a zoo in the United States and someone said that... uh, that uh, that they wanted me to meet them because they were looking for a solution to this problem, and uh, they were asking whether or not there might be a behavioral solution. Usually, people ask if there's a behavioral solution after they've tried everything else in their in their in their bag of tricks. That we were talking about, it, and we weren't really able to think of many behavioral solutions. And it was actually during one of the breaks in the meeting. It didn't come up during the actual meeting. Um, uh, the uh, one of the park rangers just commented to me. He said, "Oh, it's just too bad we can't get them to all scream in unison because when they scream in unison, we can hear them at the ranger station, and it would be the best alarm possible." Uh, and I said, "What do you mean?" And he said, "Well, you know, whenever something scary happens." The chimps will often scream in unison. And when that happens, it's such a loud scream that we hear it at the ranger station. And so it just occurred to me that if, 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 if every time a poacher approached, the entire population would scream, we might have the best alarm possible to, to, to react and respond and get there to, to arrest and stop the poachers from killing so many chimps. And I said, as soon as he said that, I thought, well, that's a behavioral thing. That's a training thing. We could teach that. And so I made the comment. I said, well, we could easily teach the animals to scream in unison. Now, often I find when I'm in these situations, my, my, my mouth speaks before my brain really thinks about how we're going to do that. But usually when it comes to behavior, I've learned that anything's – if an animal's physically and mentally capable of doing something, and I think it might have been – I don't know if it was the Baileys or Karen Pryor who said this first, but you, know, uh, you can train an animal to do anything that it's physically and mentally capable of doing. And so whenever I hear something that seems logical like that, I'll I'll it'll blurt out of my mouth, well, we could easily train that. And then I don't really think about how we would train it, I just say it. And that usually starts us down the path of, of having a conversation. And so what we ended up doing was going into uh, the national parks in Sierra Leone and uh, we put these PVC pipe systems into the trees where the chimps lived and we ended up training them to scream in unison. And then we trained them and put it on cue. And the cue was whenever humans approached, whether it be in a Jeep or on a bike or by foot, they would all scream. And uh, and it, uh, it effectively uh, reduced poaching once we implemented this project. It reduced poaching in the national parks in Sierra Leone and the park that we implemented this in. It reduced poaching by 86%. I mean, it made a huge difference uh, in in their ability to capture poachers and cur- curb that from happening in those in that national park. And so that was one of the first projects that I helped put together and initiate, but it wasn't the first project I had been, I had heard about, but it was one of the first ones that I, I started doing. And so over the years, I've been involved in more and more of these kinds of projects. And each one is a little bit different. Each one's a little bit unique. They, they, it requires a lot of creative thinking and it requires working with government agencies. It requires working with biologists to be able to make that work. Um, and, uh, and uh, we're very, it's very, fortunate that that was uh, a project that uh, we were able to succeed in. Did you say in that project you put PVC pipes in the trees? Yes, we we, we had to create uh, basically a remote feeding device. We had to find a way of reinforcing them. And so we constructed these feeders that produced that... um, 
that spit out insects and spit out fruit uh, when the animals would scream. And that was a key aspect to making this project work is finding a way to deliver reinforcers so that we could get them to scream in unison. And boy, we got them to scream loud and long. And it was a very, uh, very effective <laughs> training thing. It was, a, it, was, it, was, it was ridiculously loud and annoying, but it carried and it worked and it alerted the rangers to come running. Uh, they jump in their jeep and make it there in time to catch the poachers. And it very quickly uh, eliminated poaching in that particular area. And so the chimps would see human, chimps would scream, food would get remotely reinforced. How did, where was the uh, certainty or information that the chimps had actually seen people versus they just learned to scream to get? (laughs) Well, it's just like any other training process. You putting a behavior on cue requires that the behavior meets several criteria. And, And one of those criteria is that they don't just inadvertently scream for no reason at all. Um, and, um, and so that's just making sure you don't provide those reinforcers when they scream at another time. So in the early stages, you know, we were watching the animals through remote cameras. We were watching from a distance. And, uh, you know, just like anything else, when an animal first learns a new skill, they test it out and try it under all sorts of conditions. And you just made sure never, we made sure never to deliver the reinforcement unless there were people approaching uh, the chimps. And so very quickly they learned screaming certain serves no function, uh, doesn't get our reinforcement if uh, there's not someone approaching. At the early, at the outset, we had decided that we were going to teach them to scream only when poachers approached, but we quickly realized that there was no way to easily d- differentiate a poacher from a tourist, from a park ranger. So we realized, you know what, we just need to teach them that it's the approach of people uh, into these tr- into their area that's going to cause them to scream in unison. And so we just made the cue very, very clear, and and we worked on arrival by. Generally speaking, people didn't arrive in some of these remote locations by on foot, uh, but we did train for bicycles, for jeeps, for cars, for trucks, and for people coming on foot. And and pretty much the animals quickly learned that any human approaching us, we will scream and we will get reinforced. Is that project still going? No. Um, the project was originally funded for five years, but Sierra Leone broke out into civil war uh, shortly after the project was implemented, and so we were not able to go back again. But uh, interestingly enough, uh, the uh, chimps uh, continued to 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 do uh, to still alert for for many many years after, and they actually passed it on to a lot of their offspring. So uh, to this day, there is a population of chimps in in Sierra Leone that still scream when people approach, even yeah, though that was 20 years ago. And and back then you got that 86% uh, decrease in poaching. That's absolutely humongous, humongous isn't it? Isn't it? Uh, it was great. It was terrific. Absolutely. If we've got time to talk about one more, we, well, actually, we don't have time to talk about one more, but I want to talk about one more because this stuff is just so interesting. Can, can you, t- you talked about elephants putting the physical barriers in and creating a reinforcement in terms of man-made waterholes, and we just heard about the chimps. Uh, maybe... What, what, what would you most like to share? The other two projects I've got in front of me here are the polar bears in Alaska or the, the bilbies in Australia. Well, the, I think the, uh, the polar bears in Alaska uh, is one of the more recent projects that was very, very successful. Um, uh, climate change was really forcing polar bears further and further south. Uh, and obviously, they were coming in and attracted by garbage, by meat being hung out to dry. On, and, and so, we went into these villages and and there was it was a three-pronged approach the first was to teach the villagers uh how to deal with their garbage and how not to attract polar bears uh into their town to start with the secondly the villages were already using sentinels that were posted at the uh, uh, around the villages to shoot at the bears not to hurt the bears but to scare the bears away when they would come toward the village where i think i was able to make the most difference as a behaviorist and a trainer was that the 
they were just arbitrarily, a bear would be walking toward the village and they would shoot at it uh, and scare it away. But there was no specific behavior or thing that caused the gunfire to erupt. And so the bears didn't really learn anything. They just would approach the town from a different direction. What we did is I said, look, if you're going to use gunfire as a deterrent, you need to time it better. You need to make sure that the bears learn something. And so instead of just arbitrary shooting at them when they're approaching the village, you need to wait. And you need to wait for their nose to touch the tire of a truck, to touch a garbage can, to touch a fence, a fence post. You need them to learn that that aversive tool, that scary gunfire, occurs anytime they touch, smell, or approach something human. And uh, by doing that, the bears quickly learned there was no point in coming into the town. It was the town itself was uh, where all this bad things would happen. And so uh, we were able to quickly teach the bears not to come into the town. And then on top of that, so the third prong, first prong was teach them what to do with their garbage. Second was teach them how to use their their gunfire as an aversive tool. And the third was to use some baiting and luring techniques to, to lure the bears to locations where um, natural food sources could be found. And it was, uh, uh, again, another really big success. We piloted the program with one village in Alaska, then replicated it with other villages over the course of five years. And prior to the implementation, of the program, we had villages that were averaging 300 and some in polar bear incidents per year. And after the implementation of our training program, the number of polar bear incidents in the village would, would, was dropped down to three in a year. And so it was a dramatic decrease in the number of polar bear incidents. And so again, through good use of behavioral knowledge, good training, we were able to retrain the bears to go elsewhere for food and to avoid the villages. And so that's just another example of what I would consider a conservation project. Did you say 300 down to three? Yes, 320 something down to three. I mean, literally the number of incidents went down uh, an amazing amount. It was, it, was, it was ridiculous how quickly the bears learned very fast. And so it was, it was actually a process that each of the villages, we would implement the program uh, during one summer season. And by the end of, of that summer, the bears had learned. It was one, it was very, very quick. It just, you just kind of required that entire population of bears to experience it before they learned to avoid, uh, to avoid the town. Amazing. Look at time. We're going to move on. Although I do want to hear about bilbies, but we're going to move on. Another thing that we briefly mentioned already in this episode is working with people that might not have already embraced or be using positive reinforcement. Uh, and you and I discussed sharing with this podcast audience five things that they could potentially do to work with people that are maybe maybe even resisting positive reinforcement. Yeah, you know, I always think of it as as it's not so much that they resist positive reinforcement. I think that we we mistakenly in our community make it sound like an us versus them. And I think we are all trainers and we are all after similar goals where we we want our our dogs to behave appropriately in public. We if we work in a, a working dog world, we want our dogs to be set, successful at the job that we're trying to teach them to to uh, to accomplish. So and unfortunately, I think that what often happens is that um, we, we make it sound like um, the, the folks that we're trying to work with are, are people who never use positive reinforcement and they oppose positive reinforcement. And, and that's just not true. Um, when I grew up in the guide dog world, we used lots of positive reinforcement. It wasn't that we didn't reinforce animals for doing good things. It's just that we also used plenty of aversives or corrections or punishment because uh, the animals were doing something when when they would do something that they we didn't want them to do. And I find, for example, in law enforcement, most search and rescue communities, most uh, explosive detection dogs and narcotic detection dogs uh, will give the dog a toy, a tennis ball, uh, some kind of a reinforcer for finding whatever it is they're looking for. So it's not that positive reinforcement isn't embraced and used. It's just that um, aversive tools and punishment tools are embraced just as equally when there is a problem. Because as we all grow up in a society that has taught us that we punish when something goes wrong. 
And so I often just simply look at it as 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 um, trying to come into an organization and helping make their training more effective. And for me, um, what I have discovered is in a lot of the places that I'm working, um, transition to focus on positive reinforcement can make the dogs happier, healthier animals who then more willingly participate in their training and thus are more successful. And for lots of different reasons, um, um, are able to 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 accomplish greater are able to do the job much better if you can move them toward better use of the positive reinforcement tools at hand and so in many ways it's 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 here are some things that are necessary to working with people who may be trained a little differently than you do and how do you go about making that successful and um, and so for me, I think one of the first steps is keeping an open mind. I think you go into a situation like that and you need to not make any assumptions about what they know and how they feel. You shouldn't assume that they are predominantly a punishment-based trainer. You shouldn't assume that they are bad people. You shouldn't assume that they are evil. You shouldn't assume, and that often colors a lot of people's perception of how they go in there because they think, I'm going to go in and change them. I'm going to go in and and completely uh, help them see that what they're doing is wrong. Well, that's the worst way to go in, you know, is, is to go in making an assumption that they're doing something wrong. More than likely, if they have been doing this for any length of time, they are probably being successful or they wouldn't keep doing it. And so consequently, it's not about them doing anything wrong. It's about how can I help them do their job better? How can I have them help them get even better success? So for me, it's about keeping an open mind and just being prepared to seeing things that are new, seeing things that are different. Um, and I think it's important that we have to work hard to understand their needs. What are their goals? What is it that they are trying to accomplish? You know, most people that work with working dogs or work with any kind of animal have a real love for that animal. They, they like their animals, they love their animals, and they want to see them succeed. And so if you go in with an open mind, realizing that they have nothing but the best of intentions, you, you're going to start off in a much better place. I think the thing that derails so many people who would like to see organizations change is they come in with the idea, I'm going to come in and change you. I'm going to come in and show you what you're doing wrong. I'm going to come in and show you how, how uh, you're using tools poorly or ineffectively. And that's just a terrible approach for anything, you know. Uh, you know, let me come in and tell you how you screwed up. You're, and that's just a terrible way to start. So I, I really encourage people to begin with an open mind. Go in to that organization and recognize that they are professionals who have, who have done their job well for a long time. And hopefully they've invited you to come in because they want to make change. If they haven't invited you to be there, you're probably not going to make any difference to begin with. That's a, a, a second, that's not a, one of my five tips, but I, I think that if they haven't come to the realization themselves that they need or want to change, you're not likely going to change them. So, But if they have asked you to come in, come in with an open mind, and then as you begin working, perhaps the second tip that I would give people is use small approximations. Just like we do with our animals when we train, we don't expect an animal, we don't expect to start training an animal a new task and have it trained in one training session. We know that it's going to take small approximations to get to our eventual goal. So when we go in to work with an organization, we have to set realistic goals. We can't expect them to embrace everything that we're suggesting that they do differently. And sometimes we have to accept any progress, any small changes they they make toward your eventual goal, and we have to find a way to reinforce that. Um, another big thing for me, so that's that's what I think is my second tip. So then, when I think about uh, about this topic, I think the third uh, tip that I would give is to be prepared to learn from them. I think that we go into these projects sometimes thinking that we are coming in to teach them, but we need to go into those projects and realize we need to be a partner. And I go into those projects saying, "Hey, I can't wait to learn more about what you do. I'm going to become a better trainer by watching the way you train." And then they real 
realize that I'm not coming in just to change what they do, but to really learn about what they do. And the reality is, if I'm going to be a good partner, if I'm going to be able to set up a training program or give them some suggestions that are going to really help them, then I need to recognize that they are professionals who have skills and knowledge and I need to be aware of what it is they need and how they do what they do because then I'm going to be able to help them even more. Um, and I like to be very appreciative of what they can teach me and I like to reinforce them for what they are teaching me. Um, and what that does is it lets them see that I'm invested in their success. And that then makes whatever I'm going to share with them, um, they're more receptive to that. And so to me, that is a really big part of being able to work with, uh, with uh, other organizations. And then perhaps one of the most important uh, is, is what I would consider the fourth tip is you need to keep data and track progress. You need to be able to actually show to them and to yourself, that you're actually making a difference. Uh, it's one thing to say, oh, this is a better way of training, but better by whose standards? And ultimately, it's not just about saying, this is better because I think morally it's a better approach. That mor morality is a hard one to convince people of because everybody looks at these things very differently. So I come into these situations and say, okay, if, if I truly believe it's going to be better, how are we going to track what better is? And so, uh, to me, converting people to using new techniques is about showing them data that has, that proves that there is success. And part of that is finding the right metrics. How do you assess and quantify success? And so, let me give you some examples. When I was working with explosive detection, the issue for them was they needed a reduction in missed fines. They needed a reduction in false alerts. Well, those are the kinds of things that are very, very easy to quantify. You're able to say, um, my dog said there was nothing here and then later there was an explosion or later we found a gun or we found an explosive device or my dog alerted and there was nothing there. And so you, you easily have data on the number of times the dog made a mistake. So being able to reduce the number of mistakes and if you're able to do that and that's what we were able to do quite significantly in some of the law enforcement agencies that I worked with when it came to uh, explosive detection. And so um, in general, we we were I was finding when I first came into a lot of law enforcement areas that they would consider their dogs successful if they were 75 to 80 percent successful. But that means that one in five bombs is being missed. And so uh, when we were able to improve that success rate from 80 percent to 98 percent, that is a significant difference. And then it isn't so much about positive reinforcement enforcement is a better way to train, but for them, it's really about this is a way that we can improve our success rate at finding explosives. Um, when it came to narcotics, what's interesting about narcotic detection, you can't use the same metrics. And the reason you can't use the same metrics is that if your dog misses alerting on a shipment of cocaine or a shipment of some kind of drug, you don't know it. It doesn't explode. It just goes right past the checkpoint and you never know that you missed something. But where we found that there was a huge difference was in narcotic detection, um, smart lawyers are often able to get their clients off uh, by claiming the search was illegal or by claiming the search was not was not uh, was not valid and uh, a big part of that is making sure that your search holds up in court and so what we were looking for the metrics we were looking for is a reduction in the number of cases that are thrown out of court because of uh, poor training. And so that was a metric that we were able to use. And in the guide dog world, there were a number of metrics we were able to use. We didn't know what those metrics were going to be until after many, many years of using positive reinforcement, we found that one, positive reinforcement reduced the amount of time it took to train the dogs. Two, it improved their accuracy. And maybe even more importantly for a lot of people, it increased the working uh, life of the dog. Um, many dogs, because of the stress of 
doing guide dog work might only be able to work for six years. They're beginning to find that some of these dogs are able to work for eight or eight and a half years um, because the stress level is lower and so consequently their working life is longer. It's finding metrics of those kind and as you just noticed in the three examples I gave, narcotic detection, explosive detection, or guide dog work, the metrics were very, very different. But that's what a business is going to look at. They're going to look at something that shows that it's worthwhile for them to change from a business perspective. Too often, I think we as positive reinforcement trainers want to convince people to change because we just think it's the right thing to do. I agree. I think it is the right thing to do, but it's not the way you're going to convince businesses to change. You need them to see that it's a good business decision for them as well. And so that's that fourth tip really is keeping that data and tracking progress. And then my fifth tip, and it's just a good general tip for all training, but you got to develop good people skills if you're going to work with other organizations. And it's, it is not even an organizational thing. It's just working with your clients. You know, sometimes the best trainers I know fail as consultants because <clears throat> they're not very good with people. Um, we have to learn how to use positive reinforcement with people. We need to learn how to negotiate with people, help them find what's in it for them to train train this particular way. Sometimes it's about just helping a client set priorities. Oftentimes we fail to accomplish things as trainers because it's too low on our priority list. And we often need our clients so that they really want to see this behavioral problem go away. It's got to raise up on their priority list. And sometimes it requires some good people skills to help them realize that. And inevitably what ends up happening in any organization or any family is you got to get buy-in from everyone in the family or everyone in the organization. One person contacts you and says, I want you to help us change our organization, or I want you to help us change the behavior of our dog. And they're willing to follow every instruction you give them, but maybe the rest of the employees in the organization aren't. Or if it's a family client, the, the spouse or the children aren't following the instructions. So part of being a good consultant is getting buy-in from everybody who has access to that dog. Ultimately, I think it's about good communication. And that's what good people skills are about. And sometimes it's about having an organized approach. And so to how you deal with people. But to me, all of those things are developing good people skills. And so to recap my five tips, uh, they were keep an open mind, Use small approximations, learn from them and create a true partnership, keep data and track progress, and develop good people skills. And then what you hope is going to happen from using those five steps or those five things is that you're going to, they're going to come to a realization themselves that they want to change. And that's what's going to make it successful is that you have helped them become aware and help them realize why this change is going to benefit them and benefit their animals, benefit their organization, benefit their family, or benefit their life. So this kind of reminds me of treating them like learners. Yeah, Absolutely. They are learning. And I think that's the challenge we forget. We think we're in there to train the dog, but we're actually in there to train the people. Because ultimately, in most cases, except for very rare cases, most of us as trainers aren't actually going to be doing the training of the animals that we are there to help teach. We're there to teach the family. We're there to teach the trainers in the organization. We're there to try to help those uh, organizations or those families learn how to do the training themselves. And all of those five steps, apart from, um, I'm still brainstorming the last one, are uh, things we do with our animals anyway. So keeping an open mind, uh, using creativity for your individual animal in front of you and kind of what they need. Maybe, obviously, we use small approximations. And we're, we're always looking, apart from, you know, you mentioned with your conservation work there, 90% 9, 9 of the time we're looking to create true partnerships and relationships. Uh, thinking about motivation, keeping data and thinking about what motivating our animal and I'm not too sure about the developing good people skills when we train our animals <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it's, it's it, yeah just to build on what you just said there 
uh, you articulate it in the Kendra Mirror as well. I'm just going to articulate it in a Ryan way, which is um, <laughs> <laughs> far fewer years of experience. Um, but <laughs> it's treating them like treating them like learners. I, I, I really enjoy that, and hopefully, and I will not hopefully, I know that the people that listen to this podcast are going to benefit significantly from that. And would love to hear from you as well what what you've found worked. So feel feel free to uh, jump in the Free Animal Training Academy public forum Facebook group, or leave a comment on the website of anything that you've found uh, has worked for you. Unfortunately. We're at the time of this episode that I regret having reached because we are nearing the end. We started off with the voice inside young Ken Ramirez's head. Now we're going to ask that voice what he would like to see happen over the next five to ten years. Can you take the listeners of this show, Ken, please, into the future? Building on everything you've told us, what do you want to see? What do you really want to see happen? I, I guess I guess for me, as I, as I see the community change, the one thing that I've really been impressed with is that that I do see positive reinforcement being embraced by larger and larger populations of people. I see people begin to recognize why and how positive reinforcement is beneficial. So 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, I hope to see the number of organizations and animal groups that recognize that as a uh, as a truth to simply get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, I remember when I first started down this path in the dog training world, I felt like it was pulling teeth to get people to recognize the value of positive reinforcement. Now, I see it all over the place. People seem to really recognize it. But in the horse training world, I see we're just beginning to make those inroads. And there are a lot of really great trainers out there that are making those inroads, but there's still a a lot of resistance to to it in the horse training world. Same thing is true in a lot of the uh, working dog world. And so, just like we've talked about today, my hope will be that the problem we're facing 20 years from now is that it's just a smaller group of them that need to be that needed to be helped in that way. That they that more and more of them will have embraced it. And as I look at where people that have used positive reinforcement for 50 years or for 30 years, they are still finding better and better ways to use positive reinforcement. So my thinking would be learning and training goes through this evolving evolutionary process. And uh, and and it's always saying, okay, where where where's the newest evolution taken us? You know, one of the things that we see a lot in the in the, the steadfast positive reinforcement community is this big, big move toward giving animals choice and and making sure that animals have options and have choices. And and I think that's that's a very evolved way of looking at positive reinforcement training. I don't know that most uh, traditional working dog organizations are going to embrace choice at the outset because at the outset they feel like I have to, my dog has to work. I can't give him a choice as to whether he wants to look for a bomb today or not. Although I think they can, but I think it takes learning how to use positive reinforcement to get to the point that you realize that you can give your animals choice and that's actually a better way to work. But I think we we have to realize that just like many of us have come to our realization of what we've learned, we can often cut 40 years out of the learning process for a new learner and start them at the most advanced stage. But in some cases, that's not always possible. There is an evolution of learning that has to occur. And so I think we just, what I foresee happening in the in the future is that I'm just hopeful that we are still moving every community in the right direction and that wherever we are as positive reinforcement trainers, my, my assumption is that there'll be some fascinating new technique and new ways of doing things that if I knew what they were now, I'd be talking about them already, but that will come around the corner and we will be employing those techniques that will be about giving the animals about being a true partner with our animals, where they have a say in what they do. We've learned how to read their body language and interpret their behavior in a way that allows us to um, to be more responsive to their needs, to put their welfare first, to put their needs above all else. And I and I think that that sometimes gets overlooked. And I I hope that becomes a more universal. Uh, concept. You know, uh, one of the things I always like to say is training is not a luxury. It should be considered an integral part of all good animal care because it does lead to better welfare. And so I hope everybody begins to embrace that. And that's where I'd like to see us be 10 and 20 years down the road. 
an evolution of learning that has to occur uh, and would you say uh, are celebrating the approximations uh, along the way? Absolutely. <laughs> hey, absolutely love all of that. This has been so much fun, Ken. Thank you so much for making time for this today to come and hang out with us here at Animal Training Academy. We really appreciate that. Just before we do uh, head to the outro, can you just remind everyone, if they want to, where they can go to find out more about you uh, and get involved? Absolutely. You can uh, go to the Karen Pryor Clicker Training website, which is www.clickertraining.com. And there you can find out all about the ranch and Clicker Expo and all the other things that we are doing today. Wonderful. We will, of course, as mentioned, link to all of this in the show notes as well. Ken, from everyone listening, from myself, once again, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate being here. Everyone listening, we, of course, really appreciate you today tuning in as well. If you have enjoyed this episode and you are interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals in the most positive, funnish, choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of the episode, the ATA community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com. Click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behavior gear. There's something there for absolutely everyone. We are looking forward to having you join the tribe. That's it for this episode. We'll wrap it up there. Thanks again so much for listening from Ryan and the little voice inside Ken Ramirez's head. You'll hear from us again soon.